welcome to the stage, Paul Henri Ferrand. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for being with us today. So, you've heard about the cloud this morning, and obviously, we're in the midst of a big shift. But I would tell you that I don't think it's just about the cloud, it's enabled by the cloud. Because today, millions of companies can really transform their business by using the cloud and delivering magical user experiences and becoming a lot more agile and smarter about their customer. And in fact, the cloud is really doing two things we couldn't do before. The first one, it's really taking the complexity out of our lives so that we can really focus on what matters. And the second one, it allows us to extract insights from data thanks to AI, ML, and big data. But transformation are not just happening through technology. They also happen, or they have to happen usually, through a change in culture. And to make it happen, you have to break silos within your company, but you also have to put the customer in the middle of everything you do. Now, McKinsey is really specialized in that area of business transformation. And they've come up with three traits that company usually exhibit when they are going through a successful transformation. The first one they align their digital strategy with their corporate strategy. And so they're making sure that they can change their core business system and they're pivoting it to a new business model that is generating growth. The second thing is that they're nurturing a fast moving culture so that their people can really maximize the technology and the potential that this technology is bringing to them. And the last thing that these companies do is that they're really focusing on people, talent, structure, systems, and strategy to take their performance to the next level. So it seems to us that if you're leveraging cloud technology and the change in culture, you can basically deliver a great transformation in your business. But is that really worth it? Actually, very recently, IDC and Cisco came up with a study that basically demonstrated that every cloud, on average, every cloud-based application is delivering about $3 million worth of revenue upside and $1 million of cost reduction. So all together, $4 million impact on the bottom line. And if you think that across companies, on average, the number of cloud-based applications range between 50 to about 1,000. That is hundreds of millions of dollars that can hit your bottom line. So instead of taking it from me, why don't we hear from our customers? And so we have like six customers today we are going to share with us their stories of how they went to the cloud and how they've been able to really impact their own business transformation. Let me now uh, welcome to the stage Tony Fernandez, who is the CEO of AirAsia, who's going to go through his own story. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is a long walk. <laughs> Not used to it as a low-cost man. Um, actually, I'm slightly different from everyone else. Kind of talked to you about our story at the beginning. And there's always been a transformation for me. And obviously, this is yet another transformation in terms of uh, Google. But I came from the music business. I had no experience in airlines whatsoever. Um, I bought AirAsia 17 years ago, 
I was in music for 12 years. Richard Branson gave me my first job in Virgin, and then I went over to Warner Music. And interestingly enough, I left Warner in 2001 when they didn't want to uh, embrace the digital vision. They didn't believe in Napster and Spotify, etc. And I said, you can't hold technology back. You know, we have to work with these guys. And they didn't want to, so uh, I literally quit in Rockefeller Plaza and, uh, and left. Sold my stock options at $78 in 2001. My boss was thrilled. He always wanted to get rid of me. And, uh, and so this was a great opportunity for him to do it. He thought I was after his job, which I was. So he paid me a lot of money to leave. And I flew over to London thinking, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And I saw Stelios on TV um, in a pub. Uh, he was talking about EasyJet. And I thought, what a great idea uh, that is. So I took a Green Line bus to Luton Airport and uh, saw people flying to Barcelona for eight pounds and Paris for six pounds and everything was orange. And I thought at that moment, I'm going to start an airline. Now, there's a very fine line between brilliance and stupidity. But I thought, well, you only live once, so I'll go and do that. So I bought AirAsia in September of 2001 for uh, 25 cents, as I said earlier, and uh, signed the deal on September the 9th. Three days later, 9-11 happened. Welcome to the aviation business. And uh, took over on December the 8th, 2001 with two planes. Been through every calamity known to mankind, SARS, bird flu, tsunami, earthquakes, national carriers, but we've always found a way. We've always marketed our way through problems. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. During SARS, I don't know if you remember that, but that was a disease in Southeast Asia, and people thought they would die if they flew. So many people, many airlines cut their flights. And I went to my marketing team and said, triple your advertising now. And they thought, you know, what drugs are you on? Are you crazy? And I said, no, this is the best time to build our brand because no one else uh, no other airline is spending money on building their brand. We might as well do it now. Plus, I knew Malaysians very well. If you put a fare low enough, they will risk their lives. <laughs> okay? 800 ringgit, I'm going to die. 80 ringgit, who cares? I'm going to fly. <laughs> so, um, we, didn't, we didn't make a lot of money during that period, but we survived. And we grew. And over the last um, 16 years, or 17 years now, We've gone from two planes to uh, 250 planes, from 20,000, uh, from two, 200 staff to 20,000 staff, and from 200,000 passengers to this year, we'll carry uh, 90 million passengers. And we've always tried to stay ahead of the game. We, we have 20,000 staff. We have no unions at all. It's a very open culture. It's uh, it's it's. It's one that is very transparent, and so um, the working environment is a good environment. But as we've grown along the way, um, it's become more difficult. When you had 200 staff, it was much easier managing than 20,000 staff in so many different countries. And so G Suite has helped us in that process. We've always believed in collaboration. We've hated emails. We've hated lots and lots of uh, different older fashions of communication. We thought spreadsheets were very static, and so um, the G Suite sheets have enabled much more collaboration. So we've really focused on that whole collaborative uh, methodology within AirAsia to keep us still nimble and small. Yet, over the last 17 years, it's been incredibly difficult. Whatever, however good you are, we are still constrained by oil price, or what Donald Trump says or what happens uh, on a macro scale which affects our business. So Google and this whole data revolution has enabled us to rethink our model completely and not stay as an airline. You know, if you look at these huge um, digital unicorns, many of them are now worth a multiple of what AirAsia is worth. And they got their customers by aggressively discounting, or giving things free and got all their customers. And then I saw Uber wanting to do partnerships with us and many other companies. 
And I thought, we have all this huge amount of data, 40 million unique customers coming to our website um, every month. And over the last 17 years, a huge amount of data. So I thought, well, while other companies are building their database, we've actually got a huge database there. How do we monetize that, and how do we build our, our business out? And so what we're doing is we've created a whole new digital company led by Irene there called Red Beat Ventures, where we're going to take the data that we've got from all our airline customers and start building new digital businesses. We're going to build new platforms that will enable us to sell not just airline tickets. And obviously, using the data we have, we begin to understand our customers better. So we have two big platforms, AirAsia.com, and we have a very large loyalty card program called Big, which was named after my stomach, which is slowly going down. And we will build a lot of subsidiary businesses around that to monetize this huge database. So we're not just reliant on the airline business. So the cloud has enabled us to really transform our business. Now, it's now a work in progress. We haven't done it. Um, but again, I believe we can. We're going to build a fintech business called Big Pay, which will enable our customers to pay much quicker and eventually becoming a digital bank. We'll have AirAsia.com, which will sell much more, and Big Life, where we'll sell hotels, tours, and, and a lot more around it. So a huge transformation. But we came from humble beginnings with just two planes. I came from the music business. Many of you will be sitting there skeptical whether we can make that transformation from moving people from A to B, but also building digital businesses that will give our customers much more. Time will tell. If it works, I'm sure Google will invite me back again. If it doesn't work, you'll never see me again. So wish us luck. And uh, I'm a big dreamer. I always say dare to dream. Dream the impossible and never take no for an answer. My, the first person who gave me my job was Richard Branson. When I was rejected for an interview, he walked in. And uh, I managed to get a conversation with him, and he gave me a job. And my dream was to make him work for me one day which he did. Uh, <laughs> he was my stewardess, so dreams do come true. Thank you very much, and see you all soon. Please welcome to the stage, Chris Taylor. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm from The Telegraph, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our transformation story. The Telegraph was born out of innovation. Somebody had the great idea back in the middle of the 1800s that the actual wire telegraph service could be used to gather the news and get it to people faster than had hitherto been possible. And the Telegraph newspaper was born. 163 years later, that history of innovation has continued. When the digital wave first hit the media industry in the early 90s, the Telegraph climbed onto the crest and has ridden it since. First newspaper online in 1994, launch partners for the iPad, still the only quality news publisher in the UK on Snapchat. We were first on the Google Home and other audio devices. And most recently, we are the first publisher to publish both pure journalistic stories, and also some work with our commercial partners on stories for AMP. So that history of innovation is interesting, it's great, it's vibrant, it's engaging for the guys who work in the team at The Telegraph. But there is one constant that runs through it all, and that constant is Telegraph premium journalism. And The Telegraph has a very particular brand of journalism that has been consistent throughout that history and a very, very clear purpose. And that purpose is to champion, through that quality journalism, our core beliefs of enterprise, fair play, and enjoyment. But whilst that purpose has stood us very well for 163 years, and will no doubt stand us very well for another 163 years, it's important that we have a vision for the moment, a vision that leans forward into the future. And that vision, as you can see on the screen here, 
is to pioneer new ways to serve at least 10 million registered customers through quality journalism, bringing them journalism and experiences and connecting them not only with us, but with each other. And that vision is really interesting in a media context. It's definitely a lean forward approach. It's one that's focused on multiple platforms and multiple types of media. It's very customer centric and it is also rooted in experience, but it still preserves that purpose and heritage of journalism. And that's a good thing because the modern telegraph is now available across all manner of different platforms. The traditional part of the, news, of the business, the newspaper, is still going strong and long may it continue. We're available on lots and lots of different diverse digital channels, all the way through to our own experiential events and services that we offer to our customers. So that creates a really interesting opportunity and challenge. When you are publishing with such breadth and such diversity, yet you have that core spine of the Telegraph's own brand of premium journalism. How do you make things cohesive across all of those different platforms, yet still tailor and adjust the experience so it plays to the strength of those platforms and it's in a format and of a nature that people expect when they go to consume? Let's consider an example. The Royal Wedding. The Telegraph likes to think that we owned the Royal Wedding coverage digitally. 20% of all Google searches for royal wedding related subjects came to us. We have 12 million views of our royal wedding coverage on Snapchat. And crucially for our own business strategy, it delivered 10 times the number of customer registrations and indeed number of digital subscriptions that we anticipated. So a real success. But as you can see from the pictures behind me, the way in which that presents out to the customer is different across all of those different platforms. Yet the core story and the core journalism is the same. So what does that mean? Well, that's where the machines come in. Let me tell you first, we have been publishing in the world of digital for about 20, 20 plus years. We do about 250, often more than that, articles a day, which means we've got a back catalog of over 2 million articles and innumerable digital assets, videos, um, interactives that go along with that. Publishing at scale has its own unique technical challenges. But if you put yourself for the second in the shoes of one of our journalists, you're writing a story, maybe you're covering politics, travel, personal finance, business, luxury lifestyle, any one of these heartland telegraph subjects. You want to focus the maximum amount of your time on the creative process, on gathering the story, putting it together, enriching it. You want to spend as little time as possible on the lower value add production activities, taking your creative genius and recutting it or retooling it for different platforms. Part of my job is to try and make sure that our journalists can focus on the creative, pure journalism and limit the amount of time they need to focus on that production side. So what have we done to help achieve that? We've worked closely with Google using some of their machine learning services to create some custom algorithms. We've indexed our back catalog of content and all of the various assets that we've got. And when a journalist is now writing their article into our authoring system, the machines are reading the content as it's being written and recommending other content to link to, topics to add to the story, digital assets to include, recommending that in real time as the content's being written. The journalist then makes a choice. Do I want to include those or not? And crucially, the machine then learns. Because if the journalist does choose it, that was a good recommendation, reinforces the decision making that led us to that point. If they choose not to, it learns and improves for next time. Now, journalists have always added in extra links and extra assets into stories, but previously they did it manually. And when you have to now assemble a package of content and assets that means that your story can go out across that breadth of different platforms in that breadth of different formats, it's a real example where machine learning makes a huge difference to the publication process. But unlike when you produce a newspaper, once you've actually published your article in the world of digital, 
it's only the beginning. An article has a life of its own. And it's import an important part of the modern digital journalism task is to nurture, enhance, fettle and improve that article once it's out there in the world. So we use real-time data, powered by BigQuery, dashboards presented through Data Studio to give our journalists real-time insight into how their articles are performing. And that's not just standard metrics like consumption, volume of page views, or number of visitors. It's unique and specific metrics that we've tailored very particularly to the business needs and aims that we have at The Telegraph. So it's all about how deep's the engagement, how many people are registering to consume that content, is it supporting the drive for digital subscriptions. And we do that in a number of different ways, and it has really meant that our journalists have much better insight and much better tools available to them, both 10 foot high on the wall of the newsroom and also at their desk, to help them pursue the aims that we have set to take that heritage of telegraph journalism forward into the future. So where do we go from here? Well, projects in the works at the moment are follow a similar vein. We want to get ever better with using that machine learning to enhance that post-publication insight. How can we encourage the machines to spot unusual anomalies, an article that's being shared in a particular way that we didn't expect, or something that looks like it might take off but hasn't yet done so, so we can give it that extra coverage or that extra attention? And all the way back to the traditional side of the business, how can we use machine learning to better predict how many newspapers we actually have to print, when we print them, where, and where we send them? You'd be surprised to learn that for The Telegraph to sell 400, 500,000 newspapers a day, we have to print six, 700,000. If we can get smarter using machine learning at predicting where those newspapers are going to sell, it's not only economically efficient for us, it's also much better for the environment and Google Tech powers the vast majority of these breakthroughs at The Telegraph. Thanks very much. Please welcome to the stage, Paul Ventesi. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm waiting for my slides to come up. OK, all right. <laughs> for the last 18 months, Google and HSBC have been on a journey. Uh, we've been transforming ourselves into a cloud-first company. That's our technical strategy. And um, I'm here really to share with you a couple of examples of how we've used that strategy to make a real difference in HSBC. Now, HSBC is a large and a complex and an internationally diverse company. I probably don't need to tell you that. I think uh, there'll be a number of people here who are customers of HSBC. Thank you for that, if you are. Uh, or you'll have commercial arrangements with us. Our customers do range from individuals up to the very largest corporations. But the relevant fact that I really want to underline in this slide is the amount of data that we have. Uh, it's gone over 100 petabytes now, and it's growing every day radically fast. Unlocking the potential of that data is actually our mission uh, to transform the world's banking experience. And the Google Cloud Platform is enabling us to do that with this incredible team at Google. So two examples. These come from the areas that I run in the bank. I run. Uh, 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 global functions, which include finance uh, and financial crime risk. So let me start with the first example. Probably one of the most important functions in any bank is the calculation of liquidity. And if any of you here have seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life, then you will understand the importance of liquidity calculations. Knowing how much money is coming into your bank and how much money is leaving your bank at any given time over a time horizon is, is really one of the main functions of banking. By the way, if you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life, I would recommend it as a great family viewing film for Christmas. Christmas is coming, believe it or not. 
But calculating how much available cash there is at different time periods is actually quite a huge problem. It's quite a large calculation. If you think about it, every loan, every arrangement, every deal, you need to calculate the probability that money will come in from that, that you'll get paid back or that you'll have to pay out, that interest payments will be made or interest payments won't be made. Uh, all of that needs to be aggregated in a short period of time so every day you know what your liquidity position is and whether or not you need to go to the market to borrow cash or, or indeed if you've, got mo if you've got cash to lend. And calculating that uh, in our Canada office takes about 10 hours. And our Canada office is um, not the biggest of our banks in HSBC. We're in 57 different countries. Uh, Canada is one of them. It's not the biggest, not the smallest. It's a medium-sized. Um, 10 hours. We ported it to Google Cloud about two and a half months ago, and it now takes 30 minutes. And so that enables us to make funding decisions much better and much faster. It shows you, I think, the power of having that, um, that CPU capability on hand just when you need it. Let me turn to um, a, a different example, financial crime. Now, when I say financial crime, you probably think securing your accounts against fraudsters, and we do have to think about that. But actually, here I'm thinking of another type of financial crime, where criminal gangs use the banking system to, to turn illegal proceeds of crime into assets that appear legitimate. So drug cartels, trafficking, uh, human trafficking, ter terrorist uh, finance, serious criminal activities that blight our societies. And we can detect and deter this type of activity in our banking system. If we can do that, and we can root it out from the banking system, then that makes all of our lives safer. And one of the key controls for money laundering detection is transaction monitoring. To do this, you have to take every transaction that your customers uh, do with you. You have to compare those transactions over all their previous transactions to see if their behavior has changed in any unusual way. You need to compare it also against customers like them, people who are in a similar segment or situation as them to see if their behavior differs from what you would expect a customer like them to, to uh, behave like. You need to put triggers and thresholds on the amounts, the averages, the numbers of transactions, the locations of payments, all looking for unusual activity. It's extraordinarily difficult. And we have billions of transactions a month. We have 38 million customers. They have 100 million uh, accounts. Uh, and, and we have 1.2 million thresholds that we have to set on these, uh, on these models to detect what might look unusual. And then when we find an unusual thing, we generate an investigation. We have 3.6 million investigations per annum that we undertake in order to look at this unusual behavior to see if it is actually suspicious or criminal. And the vast majority of it is not. 98% of it is not. So 2% of it is. But we have to go through 98% of, of these investigations to find that 2%. Google's platform gives us an opportunity to do two things. It gives us an opportunity to run those, those detection algorithms about 10 times faster than we can on premise. But it gives us a much, a much bigger opportunity with machine learning and the larger data set that we can use to tune an algorithm. We can create much more successful algorithms that could find uh, um, potential investigations better and more accurately. We've already created prototypes with this, and we're already finding that not only will it run faster, but it will detect um, uh, criminal behavior five times better. And we're really just at the beginning of using that technology and pooling our data for this use. Now, as a bank, you know we are operate in a highly regulated environment. Um, and our customers do expect us and trust us to keep their data and their information secure. And we have a, a very large legacy IT environment. I'm sure many of you here share the, the same pain. We've had to overcome, therefore, many challenges and questions. 
We get these questions from the board, from shareholders, from regulators, from customers, from staff. And they have both technical and non-technical aspects to them. I'm not going to cover, you'll be pleased to know, all of these questions. Um, but I, ju I just would like to highlight two. Um, who controls the encryption keys? We've worked with Google over the last year to bring in customer managed encryption keys to a standard that will work for banks. And I think this is really important to us because our regulators and our customers expect that we manage and control the data that we put in the cloud, not that Google does or some third party does. And the, and the, the team of Google have been fantastic at being able to implement this for us and for, for all of us, actually, as we go forward. I think this is a critical element of making sure that things are secure. And the other thing I would point out is um, the top left-hand uh, uh, bubble there, um, how we work together, our culture. I mean, you might think that, um, that a 150-year-old bank um, from Asia and Europe and a young hipster tech company from Silicon Valley wouldn't be the ideal cultural fit. But actually, the partnership has been excellent. Each of us have brought something to it, I think. And we've had to change the way we think, certainly, without losing focus on control, because that is very important if you work in a bank. We've had to develop solutions that work across third parties, the technology teams, the business silos. We've had to break down those silos to, to make the best use of the simplicity that cloud platforms bring. And as we continue this journey to re-platform into the cloud, it is clear to me that we're really still only at the very early stages. We're at the foothills of this climb, and the opportunities ahead of us really are enormous. And working with the Google Cloud Platform and this incredible team at Google, there's never been a better time, I think, to be working in enterprise computing. But no one will be able to make this journey alone. You need good partners and it will be essential to have them. As the HSBC strap line says, and I think we have it dead on, together we thrive. Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage, Anne Law Klein and Enrique Garcia. My name is Anne-Laure Klein, and I work for Carrefour as the director of the uh, Google Alliance. Hi there, thanks for having me. My name is Enrique Garcia. I head uh, e-commerce and uh, digital transformation for Carrefour. Um, it's great to be here. I'd like to start by, uh, not sure I have the right uh, slide here. There you go. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we are uh, you know, one of the largest uh, retailers in the world. Uh, we sell uh, food uh, and non-food uh, products through more than uh, 12,000 stores, uh, and we operate our brand in uh, over 30 countries. Uh, through that, we, uh, we actually reach uh, more than 100 million customers uh, that we impact uh, you know, every day, uh, and we uh, generate results of uh, uh, nearly 90 uh, billion euros uh, uh, per year. Uh, we, um, uh, you know, we pioneer the hypermarket format, uh, today, we're much more than that. We're actually uh, you know, having a growing portfolio of um, uh, multi-format stores uh, where we have uh, supermarkets, convenience stores, uh, cash and carry, uh, and of course, uh, e-commerce uh, e sites. Uh, and we gain success through a, a time-tested formula of uh, uh, broad selection, uh, low prices, and high-quality food, as simple as that. Uh, today, we actually want to become the world leaders of uh, food transition from uh, everywhere. Today, we want to tell you about our transformation. Uh, a journey that uh, we're uh, uh, deep in. Uh, this journey started uh, roughly a, a year ago uh, when our, uh, Alexandre Bompard uh, joined our group as our new CEO. Uh, and he was brought in to, uh, to change course for the company. Uh, change course because uh, we we've, were missing a turn. Uh, and, and the turn was a digital transformation that is actually rocking our sector. Uh, and, and, and Carrefour simply uh, uh, was missing that, uh, that transformation. To give you an example, uh, a year ago, our uh, e-commerce sales were roughly only 1% of our global sales. And to put it simply, 
uh, we weren't fast uh, enough, we weren't changing and adapting fast enough uh, to the way our, our consumers uh, are changing the way they, uh, they search uh, and shop for, uh, uh, for food and, and general merchandise. So what um, uh, Alexandre did, one of the first things he did is uh, you know, put in place um, uh, an ambitious uh, transformation program that we call uh, Carrefour 2022, Carrefour 2022 in English, uh, which is based around our four pillars. Uh, and the four pillars is, are the ones that you have here, which do not show up very well, I think. Hopefully I know them, it's good, by heart. Uh, deploy a simplified and open organization, achieve productivity and competitive gains, uh, overhaul the offer uh, to promote food quality, uh, and actually the, the fourth one uh, is create a, 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 an omnichannel universe of reference. A good thing I know it, I, I work in it at Minicommerce. Uh, that's, that's why uh, it's okay if it's not in the slides. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and actually, you know, what, uh, what Alno is going to describe uh, later is how we're working uh, together with, uh, with, with Google uh, at, uh, at our partnership uh, to work in particular around the open organization. Because uh, in order to actually accelerate the transformation, uh, we need to create, um, uh, and that's a challenge, uh, we need to create uh, internal change uh, through uh, openness to new ideas, uh, openness to new technologies, uh, and obviously no openness uh, to, uh, to new partnerships. Hello? Thank you. So, um, so yes, as Enrique just said, the first pillar of this transformation plan was to really deploy a simplified and more open organization. And one of the first um, structuring achievements of this pillar was to sign a global partnership between Carrefour and Google, which was really seen as a, um, as a strategic alliance around four pillars. Um, the first one is e-commerce, so that's around uh, building new shopping journeys for our customers uh, through Google uh, properties. The second one is how, um, how we can use Google Cloud technology to accelerate uh, to incorporate data and artificial intelligence into our own business processes. Um, the third one is around acculturation and training. So this is really meant for our people and how they can um, transform and really work differently uh, day to day. And then the fourth pillar is really how, based on this partnership, we could grow um, on other collaborations that were not so, uh, so much discussed at the beginning. So this is really what I want to talk to you about today. The first pillar, as we said, is really e-commerce. So this is, um, this is a new way of working for us. It's about working with Google as a partner to really offer our products, uh, whether talking about non-food or general merchandise, as you want to call it, or grocery, through um, Google interfaces and properties, so either smartphones, online, and as soon as voice shopping grows, uh, basically use the voice channel as well. So this was really this is really something disrupting for us and something uh, out of which we expect uh, we expect significant growth um, because it's really a new distribution channel for for our products. So this was really the first um, the first pillar and obviously in terms of customer facing it's really the biggest one. Um, the second pillar is really how uh, we we want to use to accelerate the use of our data. Um, to really um, accelerate and gain efficiency and, 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 and savings in our own business processes. So it's still our data and we still manage it ourselves. But Google is really helping us um, through the uh, power, scalability, and agility of the Google Cloud platform um, to really do that. So right now, we, um, we, we work with Google Cloud as our preferred partner for our cloud strategy. Uh, we're really right now in the middle of a big uh, migration journey, so this is really, really just the beginning for us. And uh, regarding the use of data, the, this collaboration is being embodied by the creation of a Carrefour Google Data Lab, um, which is really going to focus on how to really leverage data with high ROI um, use cases. So just to give you an example, I mean, there are obviously a lot of Examples, but an, an example that's really internal, um, internal value creation for us. Um, it's around sales forecast. So basically, how we can better uh, forecast sales to reduce out of stocks and to improve the efficiency of our supply chain. And this is obviously a huge uh, pocket in terms of, of potential savings. Um, so this is really the type of, uh, of challenges we want to, um, to tackle with this, uh, with, this, with this Google collaboration around the, the data. The third pillar is really, as I was saying, um, is really something for our own employees. So this is really about acculturation and um, 
change in uh, ways of working for Careful Manager and, and employees. And really around this pillar, um, Google is really um, showing us through their own methodologies and their own tools that they usually own for the, uh, for the Googlers, how to um, harness a transformation mindset, how to embrace uh, a philosophy of 10x thinking, and how to really enable our own people to become actors of the change that Carrefour is trying to implement throughout the company. And really uh, also on, on much more uh, technical aspects, obviously how to train our data scientists um, and, how, uh, and to improve the uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence expertise for that kind of, that kind of specific uh, people. And finally, um, the fourth pillar is really how basically through this partnership with Google that was really structured around what I mentioned so far, how based on this we managed through closer collaboration to really find new ways of working together where uh, the combined expertise makes sense. So for instance, um, uh, around uh, growing joint business development plans between our marketing teams and Google to really grow sales in stores and online or uh, how to work together to put Google devices in every home in each of our markets. So this is really sort of additional collaborations that are really growing through the initial partnership that, that, I, that I mentioned. So in conclusion, uh, thanks to our transformation plan and our partnership with Google, we're on our way to transform Carrefour. Uh, we'll be investing uh, close to uh, 3 billion uh, uh, euros in, uh, in our digital transformation from, uh, from now till 2022, uh, we're on a, a good path to reach uh, 5 billion euros in uh, grocery e-commerce sales uh, worldwide. Um, and we're looking forward to the next steps of this, uh, of this partnership. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, and in order to do that, you know, we'll, we'll be working with Google to uh, change mindsets uh, through innovative uh, training. Uh, we're crafting together uh, innovative experiences uh, uh, for, uh, for creating new experiences uh, for uh, our customers to shop online. Uh, and obviously, you know, to use the full power of uh, GCP combined with our data. Uh, to craft uh, new uh, new business uh, cases and new uh, uh, new business growth opportunities uh, for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Carsten Wiltberger. Good afternoon. Just one more. So my name is Carsten Wildberger. I work for E.ON, an international energy company. And let me first of all say and thank the great collaboration and cooperation with Google and Google Cloud. We're doing so many great projects. And for us, this is important work because it makes us a better company. Many of you may think, what's an energy guy doing here at a cloud conference of Google? Isn't energy commodity a bit boring? Let me tell you a story. When I changed industry and joined the energy industry, I asked myself exactly that question. And I was checking in with family, and I actually had a conversation with my, at that time, 16-year-old son via text message. And that's what he gave me as his advice as a 16-year-old. He said that working for an energy company like E.ON means you have a purposeful job. In your role, you may have the opportunity to contribute at least a little bit to a better future. This is what would matter to me. So I don't think energy is boring or a commodity. So if you think about energy in the context of human history, progress has been inextricably linked with energy. Think about the early industrialization in the 19th century, factories emerging. Think of unparalleled progress based on the energy system of the 20th century. And right now, we are on the cusp of the next change of the energy system towards renewables, clean energies, and a much more decentralized energy system where customers can engage, even produce their own energy, and where also the Internet of Things gets fueled, and maybe there's a future, what we call the Internet of Energy. So, what about E.ON? We are deeply caring about that energy transition. 
and we operate distribution grids more than one million kilometers and they are the glue for that energy system. They are becoming smart and already today we have more than 500,000 generating assets connected to our grids. We also serve more than 30 million customers across Europe from traditional energy products to smart, integrated and more complex but always clean solutions. Now what's going on in that energy system? There are three Ds. It's decarbonization, it's decentralization and it's digitization. And a former system that was very linear, the so-called pipe model, where you couldn't really engage, is dismantled. And we're moving in a much more volatile, decentral world with wind farms, solar farms, with heating grids, with heat pumps. And that all needs to be managed and we can all engage as customers. And this world has to be orchestrated and data and software and algorithms play an increasingly important role. And I would like to make it specific what we are doing, what we stand for using one example. We are working on and we're selling already what we call the new energy home. And what is the new energy home? Think of it the following way. If you build a home today in Northern Europe, you will not forget to put a central heating in there. And in the future, I hope, no one will forget to put the new energy system in the home that makes you autonomous, that consists on a PV system on the roof, a battery, maybe also an Eon solar cloud where you can store energy virtually in the grid, and a battery that can communicate with the grid, a thermal storage, a heat pump, and that all needs to be orchestrated. And we're digitizing the whole customer journey. So when a customer wants to find out if they are eligible and if a PV system works for them, they can come to our website and use Google Sunroof. And they can simulate their future energy system on their home using 3D data from satellites. They can also create a very accurate commercial case based on historic weather data for that exact location. We're also working and developing software that manages that smart energy home and also the connection to the grid. It shows you, for instance, as a customer, what's your degree of auto key in the moment, how you want to use the electricity in a battery, how you want to use your car if you want to choose an algorithm that saves and extends the battery lifetime. It can also manage different energy applications in your home. And it's based on algorithms that learn based on customers' usage patterns. And that's all cloud-based in real time. And it's also very important that it's secure and safe for our customers. So thinking about energy, for us, it's not about becoming a digital pure play. For us, it's all about bringing the physical world together with the digital world and creating something new. And this is quite a challenge. And this is where partnerships with world-class companies like Google matter so much. We talk a lot about technology, but this all for companies means nothing if you don't talk about culture. And only a very few aspects, culture is much more diverse, culture is much more complex than you could summarize it. But I'd just like to give you five thoughts that make a big difference to us. First, it was important for us to reconnect with our purpose, with our vision. What do we contribute in this world as an energy company? And what we want to create, as I said, we want to advance the move to that new energy world and in that sense improve people's lives. Secondly, we are changing how we work. It's so critically important that our people are clear about what they can achieve, what is the ask of them, so clarity matters. Secondly, we are reducing bureaucracy so they are empowered to do their job. 
And of course also, everyone is held to account. It's walking the talk. For us, it's also important that we honor curiosity and courage. And we have so more people in our business and colleagues that are curious and they find their courage. And something that's very important to me is the world is full of ideas. The only thing that really makes a difference is what you do, not what you think. And that's something we're trying to establish more and more in our organization. And last but not least, it is about speed. The world around us is accelerating, but speed does not come at the expense of quality. But we have one mantra and one saying, which is one month is the new year, and that's how we operate at E.ON. With that, I would like to close and just say we are truly trying to become a bit better every day, and by advancing this energy transition to also improve people's lives. Thank you very much. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed all those customer stories and really how our customers are able to get to the cloud and really enjoy the benefit of it. Um, I thought maybe just to end up, I would summarize for you a few key takeaways. Uh, the first one for me is, I think the cloud, and especially Google Cloud, allows to create amazing, magical user experiences that were not possible before. And if you're, you know, if you're looking at AirAsia and Tony, they've been embracing Google Cloud. And really with it, he's been able to lower his unit cost and get to much higher quality products so that everybody can enjoy flying AirAsia. But in fact, it's been changing the life of many people because now they can travel beyond their dreams to places they never imagined before. Another good example of those magical experiences, I think, come from Luke you know, at Airbus. And he's been able, like, with G Suite, to transform the way Customers are, his employees are working and are collaborating. And so Airplus is really investing in the future of their employees. And I think Luke truly understand that collaboration is the key to innovation. The other key takeaway is the cloud, and Google Cloud in particular, allows companies to be a lot more agile, smarter, operating at speed, and scale. And here, for me, the, the example from Chris from the Telegraph is, is quite telling how this company has been able to really speed up the way they're publishing the news so that their journalists can really spend more time on research and reporting. And then at HSBC, Paul has been adamant in terms of saying that basically it's really difficult to innovate in a highly regulated industry. But, you know, they've been using cloud and they've been able to manage their risks with BigQuery. And they've also been able to speed up, you know, the uh, financial crime analytics by more than a thousand times faster than before. And so this has a huge impact on the HSBC bottom line. And the third thing is that the cloud requires and transforma transformation require a big shift in mindset to be successful. And here I like what Anor and Enrique said about Carrefour. You know, they, they're taking their digital transformation down to all areas of the business. And they're trying to make the organization a lot simpler, a lot more open. The other thing that I like in what they're they were talking about is they're, they're really trying to change the mindset. They're really trying to make sure they're innovating their shopping experiences across online and offline. And then Carson that you just heard about here at E.ON is combining their own assets with the digital world to create brilliant user experiences. And he's been really leveraging 
you know, the open and agile uh, cloud to move the company forward to a greener and more innovative future. So that's the gist of it. I'd like uh, all of you to give a big round of applause to our customers for their stories. And um, please. <laughs> and thank you. And that concludes the customer session. So thank you very much, and have a great afternoon.